Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. I hope everyone has been enjoying the conference so far. Uh, the organizers have done such a fantastic job putting this together for us, and I'm so thankful uh, for the opportunity to be here today and be able to get on stage and complain to all of you for the next half hour. Okay. So I'm Brittany, I'm an instructor at Turing School of Software and Design in Denver, Colorado. We teach a pretty comprehensive curriculum for web application development. And in my current role, I'm focused mostly on teaching vanilla JavaScript syntax and the fundamental patterns and concepts that you need in order to work with the language. So I'm working with people that are very new to programming. I've been in this role for about a year now, and this has been the most eye-opening experience of my career so far. Historically, I was working in strictly engineering roles, and during that time, over the past 10 years or so, I really lost that beginner perspective that I had when I first started out. I'm sure a lot of you have lost that as well, um, but working with students has brought that back really fast. It's kind of shoved in my face every single day, which has been really amazing to, to see. So I'll, I'll give you a, a couple of examples of what I mean by that, but I've started to get that beginner perspective back because my students are really struggling with things, and I've started to realize just how difficult we have made it for new developers to join us. The things that they struggle with are so fixable. And the one that stands out to me the most is our error handling and the way that we have set up this debugging uh, process for ourselves. We've become so complacent with the way that it currently is, and maybe we don't recognize that it's in a bad state, but brand new developers recognize it every single day. So I'll start with, with uh, an example. A couple weeks ago, I was teaching my students how to deploy their applications to Heroku. And uh, one of my students ran into this super helpful application error page. And he threw his hands in the air and he said, well, it doesn't work. And just moments before that, I had taught them how to look at the error logs in their terminal. So I was being kind of sassy. And I was like, well, did you read the error logs? And of course, he hadn't. So he went back and he read the error logs. And when I came back around a couple minutes later, I was like, well, so what did they say? And he replied to me, and he said, it literally said, we need a better error message here. <laughs> <laughs> this is a true story. So getting owned like this is part of my job now on a daily basis. And I'll be honest, I really don't like it. It's not my favorite part of the job. So the rest of this talk is going to be kind of a plea to all of you to help me fix these types of things. OK? So we're going to talk about a couple of ideas on how to fix these things and how we can make our error handling ecosystem better and friendlier for new developers. But first, I want to go over how we're encountering these errors in the first place. What are we doing? What kind of mistakes are we making that's causing us to run into errors? And for the most part, we are making very tiny mistakes. I don't care if you have been programming for 10 years or five months. Most of our errors that we encounter are caused by little typos, um, case sensitivity, errors in setup and configuration. No matter what skill level you're at, we are all making these same very subtle, very innocent mistakes. Where the divide occurs is that the more experience you have, the easier it is for you to identify that you just made a tiny little typo, and the faster it is for you to fix that. It almost becomes intuitive and becomes second nature. We don't even really need to read the error messages that thoroughly because we're like, oh, I must have a typo somewhere, and we can find it really quickly. For new developers, this is not the case at all, OK? I've had so many students be so close to coming up with a solution for a particular problem, and their code is 99% accurate. But in the face of a really complex error message, they think that they've done something horribly wrong. And the error messages that we're giving these developers is 
leading them astray. It's leading them down the wrong path. So I'll give you a couple of examples of uh, what I mean by that and how that's happening to our new developers. One common mistake my students make is mixing up array and object prototype methods. So in this example, we have a Pi object, and our developer wanted to add a new key value pair to this. So they wanted to add a new property to this object. And the way that they tried to do it was by saying pi.push and pushing in this key value pair here. This is not accurate. It's not going to work. But the logic here is pretty sound. So the developer knew uh, push is a method that I know I have access to, and it is used for adding a new value to a data structure. Okay? They happen to be wrong with the data structure that they're currently working with. But it's not that far off. So when they run this code, they get this error, uncaught type error. Pi.push is not a function. And as a new developer, when I read this error message, my focus is on this push is not a function part, OK? Because someone told me that push is built into JavaScript by default. I shouldn't have to write it. I shouldn't have to define it. How could it possibly not be there, right? So when I go back to look at my code, I'm now so laser focused on this push method rather than on what kind of data type my Pi is. OK? So now I can't really focus on the area of the code that I need to in order to debug this. Another example is forgetting return statements. So in this example, we have a calculator class with a couple of methods. And we're creating a new instance of this calculator. And then we're chaining these methods together. So we're going to say subtract 3, add 5, add 2, add 6. OK? But we have a bug in this code right now. We're forgetting to return the instance of our calculator in our add method. Okay? So when we run this code, we get an error message that says, uncaught type error cannot read property add of undefined. As a new developer, when I read this error message, all that I can really glean from this is that for some reason, my calculator is undefined. So when I go back to my code, I'm going to check, uh, did I spell calculator right up here? Am I instantiating it correctly? And I'm a new developer, so I'm really not super confident in the syntax that I'm using here. Maybe I'm going to play around with adding and removing this new keyword. Maybe I don't need that. Uh, maybe I'm going to remove these parens at the end of my instantiation. I'm doubting myself, and this error message is making me doubt areas of my code that were perfectly fine, but now I'm going to mess them up, and I'm going to put myself even further from a solution than I was the first time around. Okay? I'm going to check that these um, cal, cal variables are spelled correctly, and I'm not typoing anything there. But that's pretty much the exhaustive list of what I can think of to debug when I get an error message that looks like that. Okay? Final example here, uh, a lot of students will mess up on checking truthiness versus assigning values. So in this scenario, we have a pi variable set equal to rhubarb. And what the intent of this code is, is to run a conditional that says, if the pi is strawberry, we're going to console log boo. And otherwise, we're going to say yay. OK? So I'm expecting this to console log yay right now, but it's not going to because I'm accidentally assigning pi to strawberry directly in my if condition. Okay? This is not a fundamental misunderstanding of how the language works. This could be as simple as a typo. And look at how hard it is to recognize that. If you're a new developer, this is the difference of one or two equal signs that you're missing here. And what's nastier about a problem like this is that you're not going to get an error message in the console to lead you in any direction. You're just going to see that your code is broken, and you don't know why. It's not doing what you expected it to. As far as I know, there's also not even an ESLint rule that will warn you about this. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I checked on it last night, and I did not find one. Is there? What's it called? Look it up. Let me know. Thank you. OK. Um, but it's really hard for them to, to decipher where these little typos are. OK. So the unfortunate truth right now is that the consequences of making 
a very tiny, innocent mistake are so much greater for new developers than it is for senior engineers. They're spending five hours to debug the same thing that it would take a senior engineer to debug in one minute. Okay, they're spinning their wheels a lot. Our air handling ecosystem right now is the biggest technical barrier to entry for new developers. This, this is the thing that's holding them back the most from being successful in tech right at the start, okay? So this is one of those things that we really need to focus on and we really need to fix. I wanna talk about this barrier a little bit, why it exists, how it came to be in the state that it's currently in, and I'm gonna start by making some excuses for ourselves because that feels really good. So why is error handling so bad? Um, as JavaScript developers, we have some unique challenges that other ecosystems don't necessarily have to deal with. For one, we are working in a dynamically typed language, which adds a set of intricacies that uh, we don't necessarily see elsewhere. On the client side, we have cross-browser and cross-platform inconsistencies that we have to work with. And our testing infrastructure is still very new. It's still very fragile and difficult to navigate. And if you don't agree with that statement, please take that as a sign that you have lost some of your beginner perspective as well, because it is, okay? It's harder to, for us to rely on automated testing than it is for some other languages and some other coding environments, okay? So these factors are all the more reason for us to be focusing and working even harder on our error handling. And we can't simply excuse ourselves from this type of work because in a lot of ways, error handling is predictably bad. There are a lot of things that we're doing that we can prevent in order to increase the, the empathy and, and friendliness of debu the debugging process for new developers, okay? So one of the first things that we're doing wrong is we're writing error messages for ourselves rather than our users. We pride ourselves on being a very user-focused, user-centric uh, community and industry. And I do believe that we put our best effort into making really good user experiences in some contexts, but I do also think that we have some blind spots here. So when our users are developers, we kind of latch on to that similarity. We say, oh, they're a developer just like me. They're gonna understand things the same way that I do, okay? And that's not the case. We're starting to neglect the differences in skill level and backgrounds and experience. And those things have a huge impact on the way that people work with your technology and the things that they're gonna try to do with it and the ways that they're gonna try to break it, okay? Bigger problem is that we're working with computers and computers are kind of dumb. Uh, the programs that we write can only understand so much about intent. The software that we write can only figure out what a, take guesses at what a user is actually trying to do here. So this leads to error messages that look like this. This is a really popular one that my students run into. Has anyone ever seen this one? Yeah, lots of hands, see? How obnoxious is that one? So unexpected token in JSON at position zero. A lot of my students will run into this when they are expecting a network response to be of a certain content type, and they get something completely different. So this error message does tell me that there's some kind of problem trying to parse this JSON. It did tell me what was going wrong, but it didn't really hint at the fact that I might be working with a different content type, right? So Programs are really good at telling us what went wrong, but not very good about telling us why something went wrong. So this error message would need a little bit of additional code, a little bit more manual effort in order to humanize it a little bit. And I don't think we're always putting in that effort. And I think it's obvious. Um, we have historically treated error handling as a secondary priority, and it shows. I did a very quick GitHub search for better errors, and it resulted in about a million issues. Uh, about 150,000 of them were related to JavaScript repos. And I know this is not a perfect da data point by any means, but I still think it's kind of telling. And I think one of the causes for this is somewhat related to that theory of broken windows, where if something's a little bit broken in one place, it's much more acceptable for it to be broken everywhere else and be broken worse. 
So a JavaScript developer can get away with having poor error handling in their tools because we're used to it by now, and we're complacent with that now. You'll hardly be uh, recognized for neglecting such a thing, OK? I think a bigger cause of this goes back to that idea of intent. So in order to write good error messages, we need to have some data on what people are trying to do with our tools, how they're working with them, how they're breaking them. And in order to get that data, we need users. So this forces us into this waiting period where we have to let users struggle with our technology for a little while so that we can better figure out how to help them with those problems. So this forces us to put error handling on the back burner for a while while we kind of wait for that feedback to come in. And then we have a really hard time bringing it back to the front and reprioritizing that, OK? So this might all seem like quite a bit for us to overcome, but when things are predictably terrible and failing in predictable ways, it also means it is easy to fix. So we have a lot of solutions here. And this responsibility belongs on all of us. But I do want to point out a couple of key players, not by any means to cast any blame, but to um, rather make it easier for us to identify where we should be helping out and where we can be helping out, OK? Where these problems actually lie. So the first player we have is the ECMAScript spec, spec itself, the language. And the language defines a couple of different error objects, um, different types of error objects for us. And for the most part, I think that the errors that we run into when we're working with JavaScript do fall pretty nicely into these buckets, these categories that have been defined for us. But the problem with these is that it doesn't provide us with that much context. You really have to do your research on what these error types represent in order to glean any information out of it. And I've often noticed that my students will completely ignore the part of an error in their console that says type error, colon, set, uh, syntax error, colon. And they will skip directly to the error message to figure out what went wrong. So they're not even really looking at this. Okay? And those error messages are often written by platform engineers. Platform engineers are going to determine what kind of information users need, application developers need when they run into a particular error. And sometimes those messages are really helpful. And then sometimes they're more like this. And it's not quite as useful. <laughs> OK, so those are two, two um, points of contact that we have already where people are shaping the way that we're um, getting these error messages back. The third one I, I want to identify is the maintainers and contributors to frameworks and libraries. So you might be working with React or Ember, and they have implemented their own error handling for when you do things wrong. This is a tweet from one of my former students who ran into this uncaught error cannot find module. She was building a React application at the time. And one thing that I really like about this tweet is that um, she kind of makes an assumption that because she's working with React, the problem must lie within React. But in reality, this could have been a typo in a file name, uh, a misconfiguration of Webpack, uh, a bad import-export statement. This error could have come from anywhere, but it's really hard for new developers to identify where this is coming from when this is the only information that we're giving them. OK? So if this student had happened to be brave enough to file an issue on the React repo and say, hey, I'm running into this problem, likely what would have happened would be that she would be politely um, directed to other resources, support resources, a, a React channel for getting additional help. And then her issue would be closed. And maybe she would join a Slack channel for people that are helping out with, with React problems. And somebody there would say, oh, it's actually your, your Webpack configuration is a little bit um, messed up, and it's missing that file. So it's not getting into your bundle. That's why you're getting that error. And that's great. Now her problem is solved, and her application is working just fine. But the problem of this vague error message is still not solved. Okay? React could say, well, it wasn't our 
problem, it, it turned out to be a Webpack issue, right? And then Webpack could say, well, technically everything is working fine on our end. There's no failure here. It was a user error. Our tech stacks are so deep now that it's very easy for everyone to skirt this responsibility of fixing our error handling, because everyone just says, oh, well, it's not my problem, OK? And that's one of the first things that we need to address if we're going to fix this error handling issue that we have, OK? So not only do we need to be filing issues about our bugs, we need to be filing issues about the problems that we're having with our problems, OK? So it's a little bit meta. Um, but we need to tell maintainers and, and relevant engineers that it's not OK to have this poor error handling. And if you are a library maintainer or a framework maintainer, don't just close those issues. Find a way to either make it your problem or find out whose problem it should be and make it theirs. Don't just ignore those problems. Next time you are working through a bug and you're running into a difficult time solving it, don't just solve the problem for yourself and say, great, my application works, and wipe your hands and move on. Think about what made it possible for you to make that mistake in the first place. What made it harder for you to solve? What information might have made that debugging process easier? And who might be able to fix this? This is the kind of information that people need. These are the kind of issues that we need to be filing. I think we pride ourselves on being kind of a selfless community where we are so open and willing and ready to share our knowledge and our work for free, which is great of us. I love that about our community. But when it comes to filing an issue that might help some unknown developer two or three years down the road who you will never speak to and you will never know that you helped them, I think we're very selfish. We don't do that nearly often enough, and we need to start. OK? Take the time. Make it impossible for some other developer to make the same mistake that you made. OK? Next thing we need to do is start working more with junior developers. And depending on what kind of technology you're working with or what kind of error handling you're trying to improve, a junior might mean someone that is brand new to programming or someone that maybe has some experience, but they're new to your language or they're new to your particular technology. So I use that term junior um, with a lot of flexibility here. But this is going to take care of that blind spot that we have when we're trying to build for developers. I mentioned we think, oh, our users are developers. They understand everything the same way that I do. But that's not the case. They, you need to be building your technology for all skill levels. You want as many people as possible to be included in the opportunity to use whatever it is that you're building. So juniors are going to ask the best questions and provide you with the most insight into what's confusing or what's broken. I can't tell you how much I've learned from my students over the past year just because of the very weird questions that they ask and the even weirder things that they try to do. I'm shocked every day at what they try to do. Okay? So juniors are going to help you conduct the most thorough user testing that you possibly can. Okay? One thing that juniors are going to need, though, I can give you a hint right now, it's going to be more context than we've been providing them with. So my favorite uh, example that I love to hate is this e adder in use error that gets surfaced. It's an error code from libuv that gets surfaced um, when you're running an express server or node server on a port that's already taken. Do you know how my students try to tell me what's wrong when they get this error? I walk around and I ask them what their problem is, and they say, I don't know. Um, e -drin, e -drin -u -c. <laughs> they know it's important because it's in all caps. But they have no idea what that says or what that means. Even if this just said error address in use, that would be more helpful. That would be more readable for people. So I don't know why we do things like this. If anyone knows, please uh, enlighten me um, later. But they're going to need more verbosity than, than this. And I think one community where people are doing this really well is in Elm. Has anyone worked with Elm? People like it, yeah? What do we think of the error handling? It's the, best. the best, right? So good. OK, so don't worry if you can't read this. Uh, I will obviously send out a link to my slides later. But this is an example of an uh, error in Elm 
and look at how beautifully verbose this is. This is so much information. Not only is this anticipating what the user was trying to do, but it's also offering potential solutions, and then also offering additional links to read more about that concept that they're trying to work with. This is the kind of context that we need with our error messages when we're working in um, working with new developers. This makes me think back to that initial example that I brought up, um, where students are confusing array prototype methods with object prototype methods. And we got that error message that said, pi.push is not a function. And this wasn't super helpful for us, right? So I, I even look at the context that we have here. I have, a, I have a line number of where it occurred. I also have a line number there of where it occurred. If I open this to expand it and get more details with this little triangle, I get another link to the line number where it occurred. But I don't get anything useful. I don't get any extra information. I would love to see the UI of this change slightly so that when you expand an error, instead of getting a third link to the same exact place, you get information like, pushes an array prototype method. You happen to be calling it on an object. Read more about that here. Read more about prototype methods here, OK? Junior developers don't know how to read call stacks. We really need to rethink call stacks altogether. I know the Firefox developers are doing a good job thinking about that and prioritizing that. But I can also tell you that these three links in this small amount of real estate, new developers don't click on those at all. Maybe they clicked on them once, and then they saw the sources panel, and they got really freaked out and scared because they didn't know what was going on, or they didn't realize how useful it was, and then they never click on them again. OK, so we need to find some way to add some more friendly context to these error messages besides just these call stacks. I'm not saying call stacks are not helpful. Obviously, they're incredibly helpful, but it takes a while to get used to reading those. OK? So coming up with more elegant solutions like that, um, looking at that Elm solution, thinking about that um, pi.push error message, coming up with these solutions takes a little bit of research. We need that intent data, right? So we're waiting for our users to struggle a little bit with our technology so that we can figure out how they're using it, how they're breaking it, what problems they're running into. I can tell you that we have already struggled. That intent data is already out there for so many aspects of JavaScript development. All we need to do is gather it and leverage it. So gathering this comes from reading through issues that are filed and bugs that are reported. Look through Stack Overflow. And don't just look at the questions. Look at the answers. And look at what questions they had about those answers. What kind of clarification did they need? Pay attention to conversations that are happening in Slack channels and support networks. A lot of times, these conversations will help one person. It'll be a little one-off solution for one person. And then that conversation will disappear forever, and it will never help anyone improve that technology, improve that resource. Okay, So we need to be documenting those things. And then offer to be a mentor for a technology that you're looking to improve. Being a mentor, you will learn so much. Like I've said, juniors are the most enlightening people to, to work with. So being a mentor is going to ramp up your user testing and, and your ability to anticipate what's going to go wrong tenfold. Okay? Once we have all of that data, we need to aggregate all of the resources that are going to help people with their intent. And one example that I think we're doing this really well is in the audits panel of Chrome's DevTools. If you're running an audit, you get this really nice list of everything that you did right and everything that you did wrong. And when you expand on each of these results, you get a link to learn more. And these learn more links will send you to a blog post or a tutorial to learn more about exactly what's failing or exactly what's successful. One thing I do with my students is I have them run an audit on a particular web page, and I have them just list out all the vocabulary that they're unfamiliar with or things that don't make sense to them right away. And then I have them go through all of these resources that are listed here for them and read them. And by the time they're done looking through those resources, 
they can speak to almost all of that vocabulary that they didn't understand at the beginning of the day. And this is a great example, um, and I think it's a little bit easier in this scenario because our intent is very easy to assume here. We can say, if you're running a performance audit on your application, very likely you're trying to make your application more performant. Intent kind of varies in other realms a little bit, so it's a little bit trickier to, to implement something like this in other contexts, I think. But what I want us to take away from, from this UI is aggregating those resources and putting them in uh, one place, like putting them right where users are running into their errors so that they don't have to go searching for them. New developers don't know where to look for these resources. They don't even know how to Google yet, necessarily. Constructing proper search terms to learn more about the errors that they're encountering is very difficult. It may seem very intuitive for you, but believe it or not, that is still a skill that has to be learned, and it takes some time. So if we can aggregate those resources and put them right at their point of error, we save them that step of trying to figure out how to search for them, okay? Another skill that junior developers are really focused on is knowing when to ask for help. So some of my students will be working on a problem by themselves for about five hours, and an instructor will come over and point at a single line of code and fix it in a minute, just like that. And the student will just face palm in disbelief that they just spent five hours trying to debug such a trivial error. And in those scenarios, I generally just tell my students, well, welcome to programming, and I walk away. But I don't want to say that anymore. I don't want to have to say that anymore. Code is broken way more often than it is working. And that goes, that's the same for us. That happens to us just as frequently as it happens to junior developers. So we need to show them that we understand that and we empathize with that. And the way that we're going to do that is by fixing our error handling. Encountering errors should be an informative learning experience and not a frustrating roadblock. And that's what it is right now for new developers. It's a frustrating roadblock. It's a barrier for them. New developers are not learning nearly half as fast as they could be. They're not learning from their mistakes. They're running into the same problems far more many times than is necessary because they're spinning their wheels at the sight of these really obscure error messages that we're giving them, okay? They're not learning from these, uh, these mistakes that they're making. Companies are really hesitant to hire junior developers because they fear that they can't ramp them up fast enough, or they don't have the resources to do so. And as a community, we can alleviate so much of that issue just by fixing our error handling. We can make it so much easier for new developers to learn so much faster than they currently are if we just stop making it so difficult for them. So I really urge you, the next time you're working on a bug, working through an error, truly think about these things and keep it at the forefront of your mind. If you see an error message that isn't useful, try to file an issue for it. I hope that you are motivated to start improving this area of our, our community, but if you're not quite there yet, if you're not quite feeling that, I'll leave you with this final error message that I find very inspirational. <laughs> Failure is not an option, okay? So print this out, leave it on your desk, um, whatever you need to do to keep this at the forefront of your mind, okay? Deal? Cool. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I will post a link to my slides on Twitter, and I'll be around the rest of the evening to talk more about this. Thank you so much.